So good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us for So You Want to Be a Creative, career advice from the Scholastic Awards Alumni Council. Um, my name is Shannon Costello, she, her, and I'll be the moderator for tonight's conversation. So I work at the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers, which is the nonprofit presenter of the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards as the manager of individual giving and special events. And one of my favorite parts of my job is meeting and working with our wonderful alumni. Um, as you may know, the awards are celebrating their centennial this year, marking 100 years of empowering creative teens like yourselves. Tonight, I'm pleased to introduce you to four members of the Scholastic Awards Alumni Advisory Council, which is a group of passionate individuals who um, are dedicated to engaging and supporting awards recipients from various backgrounds and at different stages of their professional careers. So we have one hour for tonight's discussion about career paths, um, and I encourage all of our audience members to say hi, introduce themselves, um, and also submit questions using the Q&A feature. Um, don't put them in the chat, put them in the Q&A feature so we'll see them. Um, we're also going to save some time at the end to open up to the questions, and we will also be hosting a virtual office hour um, with our alumni council on Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern, so stay tuned for more information about that. And as just a note, we are recording this webinar and we'll post it on our blog next week. So I'm going to pass it over to our panelists to introduce themselves. Genevieve, do you want to get us started? Hey, guys. I'm so glad to see you. Not actually see you. I'm Genevieve, pronoun she, her. Um, I won a silver key in 2002, which is, please don't do the math, quite a while ago now. That's something I continue to be really, really proud of. Um, I attended the Cooper Union for my undergraduate degree, and I then went on to Baruch College to do my master's, and I am currently the Director of External Affairs and Advancement at the Children's Museum of the Arts based in New York City. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Sarah, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, hi, I'm Sarah Nervoso, she, her. I write for television, particularly animation, uh, some shows I've written for recently include Tiny Chef on Nickelodeon, The Monster High, also on Nickelodeon, and the upcoming Gremlin Secret of the Mogwai coming to HBO Max or Discovery, whatever they call the new streaming service. I promise you it's coming this year, that they swear. Um, and other secret stuff I can't talk about. And I grew up in Queens and in New York, and I went to uh, University of Chicago for college, where I majored in East Asian history, and then after I thought I was done with school forever, I did go back to school and I got an MFA from at from in film from Columbia. Um, as for Scholastic, um, I won a few New York City regional awards. And then my big award was when I was a junior in high school back in 2000. I can't believe it. Um, and I got the American Voices Award category science fiction and I still have the book, the book from that awards that I have taken with me over like three states and uh, like 10 different apartments. So <laughs> you still got it. <laughs> I love that so much. Okay, Kevin, do you want to introduce yourself next? Sure. Good evening, everyone. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, my name is Kevin Spall, uh, he, him. I grew up in upstate New York in a, uh, outside of Rochester, New York, and uh, went to a fairly small school there uh, where I, I, I didn't do terribly well, but I loved art. I spent a lot of time in, in the art room um didn't realize that I could I could make money and actually have a career in that in that path uh, but I, I tripped into the the graphic arts room and um the rest of my life was was uh, laid out before me I I won uh, two gold keys so when I hear 2000 and I think 2002 Genevieve um I was 84 and 85 so <laughs> to put things into perspective um but very proud of them went on to art school um, and afterwards uh, was looking for a, a job in art in uh, graphic arts and design couldn't find one but my grandfather was a printer and he got me a job uh, essentially the equivalent of, of sweeping floors at, at the printing company and uh, i was in printing for many many years and i was uh, honored enough to join scholastic about four years ago and I now run their global uh, manufacturing procurement and sustainability and happy to be a part of this group as well. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. And James? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is James Wells, uh, pronouns he, him. <laughs> and 
Uh, current role, I'll at least start here. I am the education manager for Crayola. You probably have heard of our company. We've been around some time. And um, Scholastics, so going back to 2001, uh, so gosh, that has been some time, but uh, 2001 was a very fruitful year for me in Scholastics. Uh, I had five gold keys and two silver keys during that time. So um, it really helped to, to shape who I am as a person today and look forward to getting into that uh, conversation with you uh, for today's session. So good to be here. Awesome. Thank you all. Um, oh. So what was that? Do I'm sorry. Know? I guess I probably, I, mean, I think everyone talked about their college background. I probably should mention that too. I think that was a, a part of Part yeah, of the work. <laughs> so forgive me. Yes. Uh, so I have a BFA in uh, in art education. Uh, my specialty was painting, is painting. And uh, so I did that work at University of Memphis here in uh, Tennessee. And then I trekked over to the Carolinas uh, to pursue my graduate work in arts administration. And that put me on a totally different path that's, you know, again, inspired my work today. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Um, so to get our conversation started, let's just kind of talk about beginning. So um, this first question will direct, I'll direct to James and Genevieve. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about who you were when you applied to the awards? Do you have a strong perception of yourself as a creative person prior to winning uh, a Scholastic Award? I'm happy to jump in here. Um, I was a ridiculously passionate painter. I was a figurative artist. I was really decisive about being a figurative artist. Um, I went to a school where art was really not popular and I was kind of the, the art girl, if you will. So in that sense, I got a lot of support from my peers because they appreciated my talent, which meant a lot to me. Um, I would say I put a lot of pressure on myself around that time, around like middle school. Um, to create work. And I thought that's what it meant to be an artist was just about the creative process of making something and going to an easel and having my materials in my studio in this like big moment of what an artist is. Um, but it actually wasn't until I won a Scholastic Award and my work was exhibited as part of the awards moment in the Brooklyn Museum of the Arts where I realized being an artist is as much about having a dialogue with the community and exhibiting your work. And that completely changed my creative process, how I thought about my artwork, what it means to be an artist, and also the responsibility I have as a maker um, to my community. So not only did the award give me a lot of confidence, it completely shifted my framework about what I was doing and why I was making it. Wow, Genevieve, that's awesome. <laughs> I'll try to follow that response of everyone. So uh, I would say before Scholastic, so, um, you know, again, I'm here in Memphis, Tennessee. And um, at the time in high school, I actually went to a middle and high school uh, creative and performing arts school. So um, it was auditioned to get in. So I was around a lot of students who were highly gifted and talented in the arts and very competitive, a healthy competitive. And I remember that Scholastics was probably my very first, if not second, uh, win within the arts. So I went a very long time of entering competitions and uh, not really getting anything from it. So as you can imagine with any young person at the time, or even now, uh, that can feel a bit defeating because you know you spend a lot of work and effort and energy in cultivating your craft and uh, just waiting for that moment to shine and seeing your peers uh, shine and you celebrate them, right? Because we were all a big art family and we knew that we were so uh, committed to, to ourselves as well as the, the whole and my senior year of high school, it all finally aligned and uh, Scholastics came in and in a big way for me and, you know, again, in winning those uh, gold and silver keys. 
And, you know, I have to say, in terms of my confidence, the result of that, you know, I got a full scholarship to college as a result of those awards. So it really set me up with a strong foundation to being, you know, entering into college, you know, of course, eventually entering into a career within the arts. But um, so that was that was important and a big benefit for myself, but also to see how Scholastic shaped my peers, not only at the school that I was at, but uh, hundreds of students that benefited from having their voice on display in a professional museum, you know, similar to Genevieve, right? Uh, here in, in Memphis, we, we hold it at the Brooks Museum of Art, which is the largest art museum in the state of Tennessee. And uh, to, to have your work on the wall alongside professionals is quite special and such a memorable experience and um, yeah, just so in inspiring. So this award, you know, again, prior to, to winning that, um, uh, I was a student that was very driven uh, and consistent in producing work, but uh, to finally get that win from Scholastics really uh, helped me out in a big way. Thank you both for sharing. Um, so Kevin and Sarah, um, how did you approach the transition from high school to the world, wider world? I think you both shared that you went to college. Um, did you do so right away? And how did you decide what you wanted to study? Um, I, I can go first. Uh, I did go right away. I went from New York City to Chicago. And I, I've always stuck to, now I live in Los Angeles. I always stick to big cities, I guess. Um, and I originally was studying I was like, I'm going to learn Chinese. I'm going to be this expert in Chinese. That's what I was going to do. And it was really, really hard. <laughs> and it was really, really time consuming. And I then at the same time started doing like random, um, I was doing theater. I was like an assistant stage manager for this production. And I remember distinctly sweeping the stage after a rehearsal and thinking, I'm so much happier than I am in the language lab. <laughs> and um, so I, I switched to being a history major. I, I let go of my great ambitions um, to learn Chinese, but I stuck with learning Chinese history. And, and I, it's it's funny because one thing is that like, even at the time my parents were like, how is this gonna be useful? What do you, what do you do with this? And, and it didn't seem like it was gonna be directly useful for, for a very long time. But then just a few years ago, when I heard about this show, Gremlins, it sounds strange, but like, then it's, they, um, an old boss recommended me for it. And it takes place in 1920s China. And as inspiration for the show, it was this book, Journey to the West, this Chinese epic, which I like studied for an entire year, focused a whole class just on that. So because of all this seemingly random stuff I had studied in college, I was the perfect candidate for the show. And, and it was like one of those things where it all like fell together. Like, you know, you couldn't have predicted that like this dream job for me would like my previous experience would like all add up to that. So it was one of those things where you don't know where life will lead you or how connections will be made later on. Um, and, and, and I'm really glad I say Chinese history, but it's because there's really great stories and you learn, it's good to learn critical thinking and all that good stuff. But it also really led to me getting this job. So it's funny how life works out that way. Um, and then I graduated and did all this theater and didn't know what I was doing for a long time. So that's another story. That's awesome, Sarah. Yeah. I, love, I love when things come back around like that <laughs> yeah no it is like what it was what it, it's it's my my parents were the most shocked of all honestly that uh <laughs> that it became useful <laughs> Kevin I think um our stories are are somewhat similar in line Sarah so my uh, experience in high school I was a little bit aimless I was admittedly not book smart so I I didn't quite have a direction that I knew I wanted to go study uh, economics or or uh, teaching, um, but I, I played a lot of sports and I loved drawing and I loved painting. So I found myself in the art room as often as I could. Uh, and outside of that, I was playing sports. Uh, so when it came to what was I going to do in life, I really didn't think all that much about it. I, I applied to schools where I thought I could play football and also um, had an art program. 
and uh, I selected a a small school more more so because they had a great football team, uh, but they also had a, a really good art program, a well renowned art program. And so I, I went to school, and Sarah like Chinese football was really hard. It was took a lot of time, and um, and and at this at the same time. I was being exposed in this art school to so much more art than I was ever aware of or participated in. I, I was traditionally a painter and, and ink artist, um, uh, pencil drawing, pretty traditional. Um, and I started being exposed to sculpture and ceramics and blacksmithing and woodmaking. And it, it just blew my mind in terms of what uh, was out there from, from an art perspective. And not shortly uh, after I started, I, I realized I was running across campus trying to make it to the stadium for practice. And I just said to myself, I'm not having fun. And I'm enjoying art so much more than I'm enjoying football. And uh, that next day I quit. Um, my The coach tried to keep me and I went back and I quit the second time. So um, that was really when my life opened up in college, and I really dove into my artwork, um, had an absolute riot, and I can't believe that my parents paid for me to go to school for four years to, to art. Any, I, This is my advice to any young person. If you can go to art school, go to art school, because it's it's fabulous. It's such a good time. Um, but also, I was trying to figure out how am I going to make a living, and, and um, how am I going to turn this thing that I really love into... Um, cash in my in my wallet, quite frankly. Uh, and as I said, I, I I leaned into graphic arts because I could see there was an industry there, and and the the graphic arts industry is massive. It's probably one of the 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 secrets of um, of of uh, industry. It's it's an absolutely massive industry with a, a, a wonderful uh, opportunity for people who are inclined to be artists. Um, so early on in the career, I was I was doing a lot of work around how to turn artwork into commercial, repeatable products, whether that be in a, a print or a poster or catalogs. So I still felt like I was expressing myself artistically, um, and computers started to come into the game there, and I kind of rode computers, and and so I, I continued on the graphic arts path, stayed with graphic arts for 25 years, and... Um, I, I actually uh, was attending a Scholastic Arts gala, um, and I was I was looking at the kids who were getting these gold keys, and I remembered I said I think I got I think I have one of these gold keys, and I went home and I opened my high school portfolio, and and the little box rolled out with the key, and the little ribbon was was with it, and uh, um, it just so happened that I had an opportunity to join the company some some months later. Uh, and have been happy and still producing art through graphic arts and uh, still sculpting and still blacksmithing. So that's my story. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, so I'll just open this up to whoever wants to answer, but um, what is what was the most challenging part of being a young person trying to imagine your path in the world? And how did you solve for that? Big question, I know. <laughs> I'm happy to jump in for this. I don't know about anyone else. I had a lot of people in my life trying to be supportive, but encouraging me to use art as a hobby. Um, I heard that a lot. It used to make me so angry. I think it still makes me a little angry um, as if I somehow would need to sacrifice my passion in order to have a successful career. Um, it took me a lot of different internships and different experiences. And I was fortunate enough to uh, these a sort of mentee in different professional environments to realize I absolutely did not need to make a sacrifice. Um, I've taken my experience and identity as an artist with me everywhere I've gone. Um, and every professional and personal encounter I've had has benefited from being a creative thinker. Um, so yes, while I'm a painter, I've also uh, worked in various industries that are unexpected. Um, not just in art nonprofits and museums and spaces like that. Actually, my very first professional encounter was because I joined a free class at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, and the two women who were leading it realized I was a talented artist, even though the class was about art conservation. They brought me in. I spent about eight years there um, creating facsimiles, which basically means fake artwork, which is really, really cool 
for the Met. Um, and I actually took those skills of making fakes and I went into the medical industry um, and I created prosthetics for veterans by oh. hand. Um, so just to say, um, I absolutely never made it a hobby. That's the one thing I didn't use my art for ever was a hobby. It was always for life. Um, and I always was able to apply it in a multitude of settings. And um, I'm really proud today to have a career where I hopefully um, successfully giving that opportunity for other young artists to do exactly the same thing and to pay it forward. Yeah, yeah if, if I could jump in here, uh, that, that was beautiful, Genevieve. And uh, to sort of dovetail on that, you know, one of the things I think as a, as a young person, uh, particularly those who are uh, on the the uh, upper grade end of the, the high school spectrum, sort of getting into college, is um, having to choose a thing, right, um, or having to have it all figured out. And, you know, I would say that, you know, as you're looking for your passion, whatever it is, uh, as a young person, passion is more of an architectural build rather than an archaeology dig. Uh, it's, it requires a lot of different things that you build and find that, like Genevieve mentioned, right, painter and, uh, you know, writer, and now she's doing development work. So it's like a lot of these various things that created the passion for all to see right, rather than something that is hidden in the ground that you have to dig for. So, you know, as you think about the various interests that you have, I would say open yourselves up to it, explore them. You don't have to choose one thing, right? Explore many things as long as you can. Um, I think that's going to make you more well-rounded and holistic and really will inform what those passions are. Yeah, I really agree. I just want to chime in, like take advantage of being as long as you can of, of having nobody expecting you home at a certain time and no small children to feed or, or older, big children to feed, whatever. Um, <laughs> um, and like, I, I remember I would have, I would have like temp jobs. And then I, and then from like seven to 10, I would be doing theater when I was in my early twenties. And now I'm like, oh my God, I would be so tired. Uh, because. Uh, but but I had enough energy and, and use that energy and I go home and write like you know sleep is important I'm not saying like don't get any sleep but but take advantage of that you need less sleep now <laughs> when you're young and also that you can explore and try stuff like taking that free class like Genevieve mentioned like I signed up I, I when I was about 24 25 my temp job had become a permanent job I was working a day job that I was like, oh no, this is going to be my life and I hate it. Like somehow I was like, oh, this is, and, and, and I was like, oh, I signed up kind of on a whim for a TV writing class that met like every Tuesday at seven o'clock and it changed my life. Cause it like kind of opened up my brain to like, oh, people do this. Like, this is a job people do, um, it is right for TV and I could do it, but it was kind of out of a desperation of, of, I need a, for me, I need structure to do art and to do be creative um and taking a class was really helpful for me and it, it wasn't like the greatest class in the world it wasn't the most expensive class in the world just even the structure of having sometimes a course could be really helpful to keep things going and just to meet other people yeah when i look back at being like in middle school even younger older i i very much felt like i was the only person with this creative interest and to meet other, other people that had similar trajectories and, and faced similar or different challenges and to be able to talk that out and know that there was a community that I belonged to and I didn't even know about it. Like as an artist, as a writer, you guys are a part of a community of people you haven't met yet, which is such an incredible thing, um, which is why you're here, which is why we're chatting. Um, like you are, you are a permanent member of a community now, which is awesome. Form writing groups. It, it, it's, it's literally, I, I almost forgot that like from that class, I formed a writing group that we met for two years. And one of those people in that writing group, we, 
he he literally has given me jobs <laughs> like he he's a writer who could hire me for stuff and we met like almost 20 years ago and we were still working together we never would like yeah you never know and it's and we're friends and friendship's great too you know? <laughs> but so yeah absolutely well, thank you guys I, i'm inspired <laughs> i hope everybody else is too i mean i see it in the chat and in the emojis we love it um so let's talk more about career paths. Um, so Genevieve and Kevin, um, could you tell us a little bit more about your early experiences in the working world? What kind of professional opportunities did you engage in and how did you find them? I think Genevieve, you kind of spoke a little bit about this, but anything else yeah. to share? Yeah, I'm happy to share a little bit more. Um, so yeah, I, it really started for me with this free class at the Met, um, which was like kind of broad about science and art and it was sort of, knew at the time, um, it was a big class. Um, the two women whose names I remember, Beth Edelstein and Sarah Barrick, because they paid attention to me and changed my life. And I'm still in touch with them, which is amazing. Um, you know, they saw that I had talent, but honestly, it really doesn't matter that much if you have talent. Um, it matters a lot more if you have passion. Um, a lot of talent can be studied from YouTube videos or books or whatever, and that matters. It's great. Talent's wonderful. Passion will take you everywhere um, and will get you recognized. And it's also it's going to fuel your creative process because there are going to be times where your tank feels empty and you got to fuel it yourself. Um, so I had these two incredible teachers who really singled me out because they saw I was excited but I wanted to learn more. Um, and we stayed in touch, not because there was a special program where you apply to stay in touch, but because we're human beings that recognize something in each other. Um, and they trusted me and appreciated me and stayed in touch with me um, just by email. And I had questions um, and they stayed available for me. And there was an opportunity to be an unpaid intern because my whole professional career started off as an unpaid intern which was frankly a luxury um, that I was able to do that. And not a lot of people are, and I'm very happy to see that there are paid internships now that actually allow many more people to have these experiences, which is super important. Um, and yeah, I got to do the ultimate sort of museum lover's experience, the like Sesame Street when the museum is closed, you know, cookie monster moment for anyone who knows that reference. Um, I literally got to work in the most private parts of the Met um, that the public never gets to see that's behind locked doors and is under construction. And I'm there overnight creating all these special things I get to go on view. It was like totally the greatest experience for me. Um, and really showed me that a museum belongs to people, um, that it's not like a private institution unto itself that we all kind of worship. Um, it's, it's something that is part of a, a community that is uh, ideally really a mirror of society. Um, so my experience with the Met was really transformative um, and inspired me to pursue um, really a, a life of work in museums. Um, as I mentioned, I did have this um, kind of stint um, creating prostheses, which was super exciting and I love it. And I think the integration of medicine and, and art is a wonderful thing. Um, but yeah, I, I really kind of allowed for my career to be largely shaped by the support of people who saw potential in me. Um, through a lot of really, really hard work. Um, and I would say I didn't limit myself for looking for just formal professional opportunities. Um, so it's great that there are formal internships and things like that, but you know what? If they don't exist, still reach out, still find someone, go on the website, find a staff member, just send them an email, tell them you're interested. What's the worst that can happen? Um, you can make something exist that didn't before. Thank you, Genevieve. Kevin, do you have anything that you wanna add about your career path? Sure. Um, so as I, I mentioned, I, I was an 80s kid. And, and so when I graduated college, um, we still did everything by mail. So I, I put my resume in, in envelopes and sent it all over the place. and waited and waited and uh didn't hear much so um 
I looked for opportunities. And I think I think one of the things I would advise is, is, is I think Genevieve just said and others is, is to be flexible and to if you're if you're passionate and at, at the time I was and, and remain around being in an in industry that was associated with art where I could um, apply my my thinking um, uh, and but I I took a role that was uh, incredibly entry level uh, just to get my foot in the door just to get started and then find ways to to uh, make a difference and and for me the 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 timing was such that. Um, the Macintosh computer just came out and it was just starting to be used. I remember uh, really dating myself when I was in, in design school, we were still using rub off typography to, uh, to create our, our advertisements. So we would have a sheet of paper with typography that we would rub off onto the paper and line everything up perfectly. So when the, the Macintosh came out, I, I used that as my vehicle, if you will, to, help me um, navigate the industry and create opportunities. And, and so I poured myself into that. And I think Sarah said, take advantage of, of no one waiting for you at home. I, I just, I worked a lot of hours and just learned and learned and learned. And, and um, outside of work, I, I read about my, my um, industry and how I could do more. Uh, but I, I really threw myself into that, uh, to that opportunity and rode the computer wave as it relates to graphic arts. And, uh, and then the last piece I would say is, um, again, as many have said, uh, open, open yourself up to networking and opportunities. And unfortunately there's not as many in. So uh, I've been working in and out of New York uh, for years and it used to be very robust in terms of production Um uh, team meetings after work and and there's not a lot of that left but to the extent that you can put yourself out there create networks um, it always comes back to help you so thank you that kind of leads well into my next question which is for sarah and james um who would do who would you identify as mentors in your professional life and how did you meet them and form a productive relationship with them Who's first? Sarah. I was going to say, you could go first, James. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I, I'll jump in. So, um, you know, I, I have to say, you know, with this, with this sort of question, I, I certainly believe in mentors. Um, but uh, to give you some context, it's obvious, right? I'm African-American. And um, my path in the arts have been a bit... Uh, dare I say unique, uh, because a lot of the spaces and places that I've been in, I'm usually the only person that looks like me. And um, so mentorship within this, this space uh, didn't come as uh, one would think or as fast or as swift right, as one would think, um, because I was a bit of uh, a unicorn. However, one person that I would identify as a mentor in the arts, that, and we talk uh, till this day, is uh, quite unique. When I, you know, I mentioned that I did graduate work at uh, Winthrop University in uh, Rock Hill, South Carolina, right outside of Charlotte. And uh, Dr. Uh, Laura Gardner is her name. So here is a, um, a white woman from the Northeast uh, who, is, who could be my mother. And she is meeting this uh, young African-American man from the South. And we have become best of friends. It could seriously be a movie. I see we have a lot of writers uh, in the in the chat here. So yeah, I'm happy to, to be your guinea pig for, for this interesting movie, but you have two people who come from a, different parts of, of the country who have become best of friends. And uh, my background at the time was in education. She's an educator. I was an art teacher at the time, and uh, she was helping me to carve a path in the arts beyond the classroom. So she offered insight. Uh, she was not only a teacher, but also a businesswoman in the arts. So as a woman, 
she faced a lot of those uh, similar sort of issues of trying to find her her space within the arts as I, as an African-American. So that was something that we uh, connected on and had some very intentional and thoughtful conversations about that and what that felt like. So she's become best of friends and I still have her notes. So I would say your mentor is someone who advises, right? This is a trusted advisor, right? They're providing encouragement and guidance, right? They're providing counsel and she's certainly done that and uh, has, you know, I credit our conversations to, you know, really where I am today. At every point I've made a decision to move within the arts, she's the person that I call to help out with that. So uh, again, I advise you now to be thinking about that. I didn't have the conversation now you know, at your age to say, hey, get a mentor, grab one. And I think a lot of people are more open to it uh, now. Um, so yeah, that's my story and I'm I'm sticking to it. Thank you for sharing that story, James. It's really, really important. Great. Yeah, yeah you know, it's funny. I What you said at the end there about reaching out, you know, I, I look back in college and I like never went to office hours and 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 I don't know why I didn't do it and I would like I found out like later all these people had all these relationships with teachers I was like oh I guess I just like didn't know I was supposed to be doing that and and even in grad school I sometimes felt like weird I don't know like becoming too close with teachers I don't know looking back it was all like in my head I think but but luckily I got over it by the time I entered like a professional career I realized oh I need to like talk to people and ask people for help um and and that is like overall like a, a global advice of like oh yeah tell people what you are looking for people can't read your your mind <laughs> you know like they they don't know like I would just think like people know I want to write like how do they know they don't know if I don't tell them um so when I think of my professional mentors like two people jumped to mind and, and one was one of my first bosses. Um, he was the executive producer on Harvey Girls Forever, which I was like a script coordinator on. And um, when I was hired, after I was hired, they like fired everybody who was in charge of the show. Um, and so the people who had hired me were fired. And I was like, oh no, this guy's totally going to fire me because he wants to bring his own people on or I don't know. Um, I was very afraid. Um, but but he he did not fire me, but he was very busy, but I was like, oh, I gotta let him know that I'm a writer. That was like something I was like obsessed with telling him. But as I look back now, like everybody knows when you're an assistant, you do not want to be an assistant forever, especially in entertainment, especially. They know you're not like my goal is to be a writer's assistant forever and ever. Um, so he he knew <laughs> I wanted to be a writer. So it was good that I, but I, I did wait until things had calmed down. I tried to be like emotionally aware of like other things are going on than your personal ambitions. The show is like, needs to be set right. And there's lots of stuff going on. Um, so I waited a while and then I was like, here's my script. And then he took a long time to read it. And I was also patient. Finally, he read it and then he gave me notes and then he gave me an opportunity to write a freelance episode. And then he hired me to, uh, that went well and it, it, things went well. He hired me to be a staff writer later on, but I think it was cause I also was, it wasn't being too pushy about it. And now we're, we're, we're we, I was just texting with him today about asking him advice about the show I was developing and at, at Warner Brothers. And like, he was like giving me his gossip and, and I could give him gossip about the industry. So it's it's to his benefit that he's my mentor, really, at the end of the day. But <laughs> but um, but it was also about like kind of feeling out the situation because a lot of times I feel like you can it happens to everybody, you kind of get hyper focused on your own problems, your own struggles, and like to take a step back and be like, oh, everybody, especially if you're on a, a production of any kind we're all trying to do stuff here um it's not just about like Sarah Naboso's career um but I also want to mention another another mentor which is um Aliki Theophilopoulos I'm trying to say her name correctly um and she's a she was on the art side she's a she came up through animation through art but she's a showrunner and I was really excited to work under her because 
she is a female showrunner and she has two kids and I wanted to have kids and I approached her to talk to her about it. Um, this is now many years ago. And she was so excited to talk to me about like trying to find work-life balance. And, and that was something that like, I try to also, I, I've now realized I'm like mentoring other women in animation who are having, I have a four-year-old who are having kids and stuff. Cause they, cause it is actually still unusual to be, I don't know, unusual, but more people than not don't have kids in the, in, or who are mothers who are working in the animation industry. So I was surprised to find out somebody was looking to me as like a model for like, wow, you have a career and you have a kid. And meanwhile, I, I had been like asking a leaky for advice along the way. Um, and that's something also to look at, to like, look, sometimes like, it sounds weird, but like, I, whose life do you want to have? I want to be like this person. This person's like so cool and they seem to God together. I'm sure they have their own problems, but you reach out to them and tell them what they, what you, what you are dreaming about. Um, and they can maybe just help you and tell you their story or tell you a good preschool, <laughs> which is also what she told me. But, yeah. <laughs> Great advice. Love that. Um, and so here's a question for everyone who wants to jump in, but what led you to the professional role that you're in now? How is your current role a product or an evolution of where, um, what you've experienced in your professional life so far? Shannon, I can, I can talk about my current role. Is that yes, what, current yeah. role? Yep. So I, I guess it's, it's, um, somewhat ironic, but, um, years later, as I mentioned, I followed the graphic arts, uh, field and I, I ended up, uh, um, running a, a, a book printing company here in Michigan. And, uh, one day, um, Scholastic came, they were printing a Harry Potter and they didn't have enough uh, capacity to print uh, this, this edition of Harry Potter. And so I convinced them that we could help them with that. Uh, so my company became a, um, a vendor to Scholastic. And as I mentioned, years later, I, um, I was at one of the galas and, and someone had remembered that we performed so well on that Harry Potter book that we, we got to be friends. And uh, Heath Garvin was, is my, a mentor in this case and they had an opportunity they thought i would be a good fit for which was essentially building out their their print manufacturing and um, um as i mentioned also sustainability so they they offered me that opportunity so it was directly related to um uh, being a classic vendor and printing harry potter and um, and that all came from my graphic arts experience which uh I was influenced a great uh, deal by the uh, the gold key that I won in 1984, 1985. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. For, for me, um, I don't want to cut anyone off, but just jumping in. Um, I ended up going um, to a college called um, the Cooper Union for the Advancement um, of Science and Art. Um, this was when I attended still a scholarship based school, which is a really special thing about it. It has an endowment, it had an endowment um, that meant that every person who was accepted um, got a full ride. Um, it was really instilled in me um, that this wasn't just like a freebie for you, um, that, that this was like a social contract we were signing, that um, we were super privileged uh, to receive this incredible education and that we should devote our time postgraduate um, to paying it forward to other people. Um, so I ended up working a number of different um, art nonprofit jobs that were super community-based and continue to be. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm the Director of External Affairs and Advancement at a 34-year-old nonprofit based in downtown New York City called the Children's Museum of the Arts. Um, it's all about creating opportunities for really the most emerging artists um, to provide encouragement. Um, it's sort of uh, pretty established that there's a lot of um, supportive team programs, but not a lot of programs for very young people. Um, and so that's the work that we do there. And, you know, wherever I go next in my life, I will be doing the same thing to pay it forward. Um, and all throughout these professional experiences, 
um, something that I found really rewarding is always participating in some sort of mentorship program, um, which I always thought was something that I would have to be like super professionally achieved and senior to do. But as it turns out, wherever you are in your life, you've had a bit more experience than someone else. Um, so all of you in the chat, what you're doing right now is kind of a little <laughs> early form of mentorship, actually. Um, there's always going to be someone who's a few years younger or from someplace perhaps more rural. Maybe you're from a city and you have greater exposure to something that they don't have. But there's a diversity of experience here. Um, and any opportunity you can have to share your knowledge will help you to be a better person and a better member of the community and a more confident person uh, for your career trajectory and personal trajectory. Um, so I, I really encourage you to do that. Um, and I'll bet that everyone else on this call, we're probably part of different professional networks too and have mentors at our age as well. Um, I, I definitely am a part of different professional groups. Um, some are like specifically for women in the arts because there are a lot of women in the art world, but not a lot of women who are in senior positions. And so we help each other. Um, and there are a lot of women, especially that I admire who have influenced my career now and will continue to, and I admire them. So just to say like mentorship is something that's hyper intergenerational. You don't need to be at a certain point of your career, certainly not the apex of your career, whatever that means, um, but always to kind of look both directions and that'll help you to figure out like where you are right now, because that could be super confusing and everything can feel really intense right now. Um, and it can provide a lot, a lot of perspective. Thank you for sharing. Um, so real quick, we have some people um, putting questions in the Q&A. Um, if people want to go through that and upvote questions, um, a lot of we're seeing a lot of the same questions. So if you want to upvote, that would be great because we have just about 10 minutes left um, and we definitely want to get to some of your questions. Um, but I'm sorry if James, did you want to add anything to that? No, we can go ahead and get to the questions. Um, yeah, certainly want to engage with the audience here. Cool. OK, so I'm going to start with one that came in through the registration. Um, is it possible to be creative and not follow a path in art, a career path in art? Absolutely. If I could jump in uh, yeah. with that one here. So uh, so if we talk about art, what's really the secret sauce uh, of art? Uh, and I would say is creativity and creativity is in everything. Uh, I have had the pleasure of you know, being at Crayola and uh, having people on as I'm having conversations and speaking about creativity in different professions. And I saw a, a comment or a question around STEM and the arts, like how can I find that connection? And uh, NASA actually has a vision, as a position, an earth science visual storyteller where they look at satellite images of the earth and create narratives and stories and animations around that, right? So this doesn't require a strong arts, uh, visual art background, if you will. Um, and you think about other uh, forms uh, of, of creativity. You have your culinary artists, you have your barbers, right? Uh, so you have a lot of these people that you touch and interact with on a daily basis that don't have a, a quote unquote uh, BFA or MFA in any art form. So, you know, again, I think the important thing is creativity is in everything. And I think that's what fuels us all. So find the creativity in you and tap into that and that will carry you in any profession. Great answer. <laughs> um, this one, I think maybe Kevin can answer, um, but uh, people want to know, do you have any publishing tips or information? Um, yeah, another person had asked, how do you publish a book? Who do you have to reach out to? Um, well, it's easier today than ever. Uh, there, are, there are paths to follow. Um, the, the, the reality is um, most publishers have uh, received far, far more manuscripts than they could ever publish. So the uh, the unfortunate um, circumstances, many manuscripts that 
route through publishers are are uh, are not selected, but um, that doesn't mean that another publisher might not pick it up. But generally speaking, the traditional path is you would go through an agent, and the agent would would source uh, your your book to uh, publishers who produce in that genre. Uh, but the, now the the um, process of independent publishing and self publishing. Uh, allows uh, a whole host of of uh, ways to get your your book out there, uh, whether that be a novel or or um, uh, an artist book or photography. Um, I I would certainly pursue that uh, path. I I actually uh, published a book on publishing books through an, an independent um, publishing process, and that's the independent publishing process is basically a house, an independent house that will publish your book, but you share in the cost of that publishing. So there's a there's a portion of the production that you as the author would help fund, and then you would receive royalties on the back end that might be a little higher than, than traditional royalties. Um, uh, so that would be my, that would be my advice. Uh, get your book out there, uh, uh, even if it's self-published or independently published. Uh, to get your content out there. And then and it's often discovered then by traditional publishers. Yeah, I just uh, want to also say web comics is something that um, people are really paying attention to. Um, and like, um, I've had several meetings over with, with all these pr production companies, like we got to we got to get these web comics and turn them into animated shows, or we got to buy them and option them look at all these web comics which ones are you interested but people are paying attention to them and it's a very i mean huge world and it's a really a way to to gain audiences and and get followings and fans it's pretty cool yeah that's a great idea um so here's a question maybe for everybody um Will having to depend on your art or writing to pay the bills take away the joy of it? No. <laughs> Great. <laughs> no, hard, hard, no. <laughs> um, I think I, I touched on this in the beginning. It's so important to put your art out there. If your art is only existing in your bedroom studio, as mine did for a very long time, because I thought that that was the full universe for some reason of creativity, um, that I, that's fine, but it can be so much more. And don't deny yourself um, the opportunity to make yourself vulnerable. I know it's super scary to put your art out there or your writing out there but let the world experience it and allow yourself the incredible moment to advance your ideas, your creativity, whatever it is that you're thinking about, it will only benefit from having other people respond to it. For me, as a visual artist, exhibition was such an important activity um, and it really didn't occur to me till later. Um, for writers, you don't necessarily have to publish your work Perhaps you're just in a small group and you share your writing. It, nothing has to necessarily be on such a formal scale, um, but it's important to get your work out there. And at no point did making a profession of it ever take away from my joy of, of my work. Um, and I almost wanna like dilute the profession word a little bit. Uh, it's really just part of life. Uh, it's, it's just getting your work out there. Um, I feel like profession is so attached to money. Um, and I, I think that's obviously important in its own way. Like we all have different needs we have to maintain a certain quality of life or materials so that we can make more work. Like that's the study of art, right? Like look at famous painters. Why did a lot of their work change over time? Because they can suddenly afford more materials or work in a bigger space. And so the campus has got bigger. Like it's all connected, um, but it's it's, it's not about um, your art being a successful career at the end of it. It's just, you're making your art with your life and that's who you are and it's your identity. And you hopefully find a supportive community for that. Sorry, that was very heady, um, but I mean it. <laughs> no, I loved that. <laughs> that's great. 
Um, and I do keep seeing, we are gonna post a recording of this webinar on our blog, on YouTube, for people who want to go back and listen to all this great advice again. So just sharing that again. So I think we have a couple, we have a couple more minutes. Um, we can answer a few more questions. Um, so here's one for everybody. How do you deal with creative block or get motivation and inspiration? I would say um, I actually had that today. <laughs> uh, so I work from home here. And um, one of the things I had to do was get out of my environment and uh, go for a walk. I like to get out in nature and just wander and get lost. Uh, we've had some really nice weather here lately. I've been seeing a lot of folks in the chat talking about snow and various things and uh, sending some warm weather your way, hopefully. But um, for me, it's important to get out of the screen, right? <laughs> uh, because that can be quite limiting and into nature to hear the sounds, to feel the wind, right? Um, uh, to feel whatever temperature it is, right? Uh, to me, getting out there really helps to center and get rid of the distractions because as much as we love technology and it's so important, it can be a bit distracting and overwhelming, right? And uh, I like to get back to the analog way of doing things, right? So for me, that helps. And believe it or not, I was able to get out of that block and uh, come back and do some writing, which uh, was a part or is a part of some of the work that I do at uh, at Crayola. So yeah, nature, nature walks. Yeah, I also like, I, I guess I don't get into nature, but I walk and I make playlists sometimes of different, I love obsessing over playlists and then um, yeah, getting like a notebook and putting the computer away and just sometimes it's so simple, but just writing without purpose sometimes clears out, you know, just writing your thoughts is a good, like, <laughs> just vomit your brain out onto a, a page. And then you're like, oh, that's an idea. And then it will still like, you know, think about it in the shower, think about it, you know, but, but to, to just, um, to just start working and start writing um after after the great long walk sometimes can really like shake things up um a lot of times when i'm trying to figure out what comes next in a story or a script uh paper is is my best friend because then you can draw different connections you could draw arrows there stuff you can't do on a computer usually um unless you have a really fancy one um uh, yeah i have a similar thing i like to do especially for art making if i've hit a wall um, just like loosening your hand up and making something that's completely just about like the tactile experience of the material and not thinking at all about like, it's a canvas that's expensive and I'm gonna do the wrong thing. And what if I do this and blah, none of that, but just like getting something really fundamental like charcoal and like a cruddy piece of paper that I'm not worried about messing up and it doesn't cost anything big and just being really loose and just making something and facing it. Um, and it usually really gets my like nerves down and gets rid of that creative block. And I can usually get back to the thing that I'm really interested in. I would, I would add that um, I've gotten very comfortable with uh, just walking away from uh, a painting perhaps that I'm stuck with or, or a sculpture. Um, and, and at times through my life, art just, there wasn't space for it. And I had to kind of ignore it for a, a period of time. And, and I was okay with that. And knowing that when my life changed or whatever circumstance I was in, I would have time uh, to go back to that. And I would, and, and I found that that's worked for me and to not get so stressed out about the block and just kind of lean into it and say, you know, I'm not, I'm not feeling it and just walk away in some cases for months. And then, uh, this painting I'm working on right now, um, I went back to and I've been painting on it for months. Um, so so just letting that be fluid and being okay with that uh, has, has worked for me. These are all great tips. <laughs> um, so we're at eight o'clock now. 
Um, thank you guys so much for this conversation. I think it was really inspiring and insightful, and I think everybody agrees with that. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned up at the top, there is going to be an opportunity to chat with our alumni council members more and ask them more questions during a virtual office hour session, which is going to be on Thursday, March 2nd at 7 p.m. Eastern time. So we're going to be following up with an uh, email with registration information tomorrow, so keep an eye out for that. Um, in the meantime, please stay connected with the awards and follow us on social um, and be sure to join the Scholastic Awards alumni group on LinkedIn. Um, I'm going to drop that uh, URL in the chat and um, really thank you all for being a part of the Scholastic Awards community and um, I hope you have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. I hope we can see your work one of these days. We can't see, we see the chat. I want to see the work too. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks everyone.